the uh, having the the Beatles seal of approval for the band would be a fair comment to say it opened a lot of doors for you at the time. Oh yeah, I'm sure it did. Yeah, yeah, they were. Uh, I'm sure they were more than instrumental, and it was getting a lot of breaks and stuff. And, yeah. On the other hand, though. In hindsight, do you think it might have placed a, a lot of pressure on you too to come up with the goods? Um, not really. I think we were doing the stuff anyway. You know, we were all writing anyway. I was writing before I joined Badfinger, and, and uh, I know the guys had been working on songs for a few years before I joined them, and had been, in fact, uh, approached by other record labels um, to sign. Yeah, uh, and uh, had turned them down because their manager apparently had, got, had heard, heard something about the Beatles forming a record label. And so he kind of held out and uh, eventually uh, was able to shop the band to uh, Apple Records. I think uh, Mal Evans uh, saw the band and was kind of instrumental in getting them signed, you know. Yeah. Mal was one of the Beatles' roadies and he eventually produced uh, No Dice and No Matter What. Our first uh, kind of self pen big hit, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you, do you have memories of your the circumstances uh, surrounding you joining the band? Uh, yeah, I was. Um, I'd been in a group called uh, Gary Walker and the Rain, uh, which was an offshoot of a band called the Walker Brothers. Oh yeah. And and um, in '68 that was. And then, you know, the band broke up, uh, and I went back to Liverpool, and, and so in the summer of 69, I was kind of hanging in Liverpool, rehearsing, and uh, fooling around with a couple of friends, uh, and uh, the, the Badfinger called, and, and said they were looking for a guitar player, and somebody had recommended me for the job, and, uh, you know, this was kind of late summer, getting into, actually into November, I went down there uh, to London and auditioned for them at the house in, in uh, London. Uh -huh. and uh, got the job so uh, there it was yeah. those Apple years were certainly the, the golden years for the band but success always seemed to be stronger in America than England didn't it yeah yeah we did get a lot more there was, there was a lot more acceptance of the band in in, uh, in America for some reason you don't have a personal theory on why that was uh, maybe because they thought in England that we were copying the Beatles or something yeah uh, in America they seemed to uh, you know, of course, a couple of people said that about us in America, but the majority of the uh, the writers and stuff uh, were saying very complimentary things about Badfinger and about us being our own, you know, our individual selves. And, and uh, you know, so maybe they were just a bit more open-minded about it. Maybe the, maybe the English uh, press and maybe the English people felt a bit possessive about their Beatles and they couldn't stand the idea of somebody else coming along, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's a fair comment. Well, um, I don't know. It might, you know, maybe these are all maybes, aren't they? You know. Yeah, well, it's all. You know, Baby Blue. Uh, I was just reading the other day. It wasn't even released as a single in England. I don't think. You know. It wasn't. It's kind of bizarre, isn't it? You know? Yeah. I read somewhere that uh, I believe there's a, a video history of the band uh, just about to be released, or it just has been released. It's being released right now. They've just got. Uh, well, finally, uh, the, the Apple and the Beatles have said no. You can't use the. Uh, you can't use any of the footage, you know. So, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be re-released. It's going to be, I'm not re-released, but released. Um, and uh, it's very comprehensive. We're, we're anxious to see it, actually, to see how much of the interviews uh, the guy put in there. But in answer to your question, yeah, it is coming out now. Right, but you haven't seen it yourself yet? I haven't seen the, the actual edited finished thing. I've seen roughs of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were pretty good, you know, the interviews come across, it's, uh, you know, the guy came and interviewed myself, he interviewed my wife Kathy, he interviewed um, Mike Gibbons, uh, and I think a little bit of Mariana, maybe a little bit of uh, Bill Collins, and we could never get in touch with Petra, or he could never get in touch with them, to, to have them come and uh, do, do interviews, they've been very exclusive, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Hammer State and that stuff, but... Um, you know, it is pretty comprehensive. He asked us all the questions, and the one I saw, it seemed like it was very continuous as well. The, the you know, I'd be telling a story, and he'd cut to Mike, and Mike would be telling the same story, and then uh, go over to Kathy, and Kathy would be telling the same story, and it all continues along very well, you know. Huh. So uh, I'm looking forward to people seeing it. Sure. Um, you left the band first time around about 1974, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Any particular? You remember the reasons uh, surrounding that? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was simply that we, you know, my wife was uh, 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 
pointed out some stuff to me, uh, and she'd met some people. Uh, I was in Los Angeles um, that, that that wanted to help the band. Uh, we were being ripped off really bad, apparently, and we don't we didn't know anything about this. We we're a bunch of airheads, you know, <laughs> and uh, very naive about the whole thing. And uh, um, she'd found this stuff out uh, just from visiting friends and stuff. And uh, I mean, that sounds a bit peculiar, but it's the, the friends that Kathy had were. Like you know, May Pang, John Lennon's girlfriend, and people like this, you know. So she was she was around a lot of uh, very influential people, and uh, I told we, we she you know of course told me about this stuff. Um, you know stuff like for instance Peter, uh, the, the the business manager in Los Angeles was uh, shopping a solo deal for Peter Ham, you know, uh, behind everybody's back and all this kind of stuff going on. Yeah, and. Um, I took all this information with me back to England uh, when we went back there, and uh, I presented it all to the group. And, and the group, uh, Mike was, was kind of impressed by it all and wanted to do something about it. Peter uh, got very angry about the whole thing, and, and uh, you know, he, he said that his actual words, we were at a meeting actually in London, and his actual words were, I don't want Kathy managing this band. I mean, like, you know, it, it was stupid. And um, he left the band. Uh, that's how strong his reaction to the whole news was. Uh, Tommy laughed about the whole thing. He, he didn't believe it either. And, uh, you know, I said, well, look, if we're not going to do anything, you know, it's a cut a long story short here, but uh, if the band's not going to make any changes in what's going on, then there's really no point in us in, in, in being a band anymore. You, you know, it's kind of it's kind of stupid. And uh, I decided to leave the band, you know. Mm. Uh, no, not, nobody ever. Nobody did anything about the situation after I left, and of course Peter was dead six months later, destitute and broke in London. Right. The and, um, uh, that, I really believe uh, to this day that if 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 the manager in in London, our personal manager, and and the, and the group was just you know stuck together and stuck to its guns, we could have we could have survived that. Uh, and I think we you know we may we may well have been together for years to come, you know. And I, and I think Peter would have been would have been alive today, you know. He'd be bloody angry. Uh. Situation re regarding the royalties on on without you that that's been a, a an ongoing saga, hasn't it, over the years? Could you give us a, a brief rundown exactly what's the state of things there? Yeah, um, we did a, when I joined the group in '69. They, they'd already been together for several years and had themselves an agreement that they'd made amongst themselves, uh, along with Bill Collins, their personal manager that uh, everybody would share in songwriting royalties as long as that song was recorded by the band. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't recorded by the band, then it was nothing to do with the agreement. Only stuff that was recorded by the band. And uh, as it happened, th this was before anybody wrote any hit records or anything like that. And it was just a way of assuring that everybody, you know, because everybody does contribute to a band's success, um, everybody in the band it would participate a little bit in the royalties yeah. of every song that the band recorded. Well, without you came under that agreement, and uh, so we all share on the royalties for that, you know? And the, the wife of Tommy right now um, is insisting that the song didn't come under the agreement, and therefore we shouldn't get the royalties. We, and, you know, that's, and that's the dispute that she's going on about now. Um, What's her reason she for that? Wasn't party to the original agreement. She wasn't even there. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't there either. But when I joined the band, I, came, I became a, a member. Uh, uh, Bill Collins had this expression "mutatis mutandi," where, you, where when you join an organisation, you take on its profits as well as its debts. You know? Yeah, fair enough. And uh, I joined the group on, you know, under those conditions and. Uh, of course, you know, I started, I, I, I got the benefits of our later success, I mean, and that's what happened. And the dispute right now is with Mariana, uh, Tommy's uh, widow, mm -hmm. uh, and she... What's her reasoning be behind her theory? What, what's her reasoning behind that? I mean... Well, she is convinced that those song, that, that song, that particular song, doesn't come into the agreement. Because, I think because she's confused because uh, Nielsen had the big hit with it. Yeah. You know, and then Mariah Carey had the big hit with it. And uh, I don't know if she's confused by that, uh, you know. So that, and, and that's just basically what's going on with it. I, I have no idea. I have no idea. She's she's going around saying things about us. Uh, she's going on English television saying things about us. Uh, 
saying that I argued with Tommy about this, which is which is absolute crap. Uh, my uh, only thing that I ever talked to Tommy about these royalties were, uh, Tommy, whatever the papers say and whatever the agreement is, uh, that's you know I'll go along with it. If if without you is not a part of the agreement, then you know that's fine. You know. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's all I could say about it. There was nothing to argue about. Are things any closer to being rectified there, or it's it's still just dragging really on? I don't know. Uh, to tell you the truth, it's it, it's gotten beyond the joke now. Where they're going on TV, and she, you know, she says things like she's got no money and stuff. And I know she's made like pretty much close to a million dollars in the past four years. You know, off the royalties for those songs. Uh, she gets money from Peter Ham's hits. You know, mm. and she gets money from all the rest of the songs. Um, you know, uh, and plus she gets a share of all the record royalties, of course. You know, she gets Tommy's share of all that stuff. Uh, I think she's just angry and bitter about certain things, and, and um, that's all really I want to say about it. I don't want to be slagging her off or saying things yeah, about fair it. Enough. She has her own personal life. that She lives the way she personally likes it. And uh, that's enough said about that, you know? Um, that's a, that's really all I can say about it without getting kind of mean and vicious, you know? Yeah. Personally, though, being at loggerheads like that, with, with people that obviously you were close to at one stage. Oh, yeah, these people come and stay at our house. Yeah. You know, and, and they're friends of ours. We've known these people 30 years, 35 years. And, and to, you know, to have them go on about this and, and go on and on and on about it, you know, to the point where my family in England is affected by it, my brothers and their families, and, and uh, my friends in Liverpool that I grew up with are hearing these outrageous things that Joey Mulland, uh, you know, takes money from people and stuff like that, things that just plain aren't true. You know, and of course, I'm 6,000 miles away in America. Uh, it's very difficult to defend yourself. Exactly, uh, yeah. You know, so these people are saying these things, and it's, it's gotten beyond the joke now. It's gotten beyond, oh, leave it out, it'll go away. You know, because it, it, it's obviously not going away, you know? Yeah. Well, it's a bit, I mean, you hear about it down in Australia. Well, that's right. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, what the heck is going on here? We're, we're at home here trying to work, trying to do things, you know? And uh, trying to sell Badfinger records and trying to promote Badfinger. We have done for years. And, uh, you know, you get this kind of stuff... Uh, it must be tough try, trying to maintain you know, a positive attitude and concentrate on the music while all this is going on, too. Well, yeah, it gets virtually impossible. It gets, you know, to, to actually uh, concentrate on writing songs or doing new stuff. It gets, you know, because it just eats it away. It eats all the time away, like you say. It gets on your mind, and your songs get bitter, you know, and angry, and that's not really the kind of songs anybody wants to really hear, you know? Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's just a bit much. It's a bit much. Hopefully, we can get it sorted out. Uh, I know, uh, you know, my, my wife and I, uh, we've, we're reacting in the only way we know how uh, to these situations, and that's uh, through the press agencies and stuff like that. Um, and we're going to try and get our, our, you know, our point of view and our opinion out there so people can see it. You know, and actually the facts of what did happen uh, in the old days and in the interim period. Uh, a live album that uh, you worked on recently. There's a bit of problems with that as well. Yeah, it, again, this is... Uh, I produced the record, and I've been getting paid production royalties for it. Um, and this is like over now, over six years now, seven, eight years or something since it came out. Oh, everybody's been aware of this record since it came out, and everybody's received all their publishing royalties for it. Um they found out that I'm getting production royalties for it, and they don't like it. Uh, the, 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 uh, they say that I didn't produce it, and they say that uh, all I did was mix it, and, and that uh, it doesn't matter that I spent, you know, thirty thousand, well, thirty thousand dollars in uh, in paying for the studio time and paying the the co-producer. Uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter that we spent two hundred hours in the studio working on this thing, you know what I mean? They think it was just a live tape, we just threw it on the machine and, and mixed it, balanced it up. And it wasn't like that at all. You know, we did a tremendous amount of work on it. And uh, they just don't, they're angry. They see the amount of money that we've made over eight years about it, or seven years, whatever it is. Uh, they see the amount of money that I've made, they go, that's not right, I shouldn't make that money. Well, I don't understand that. Why shouldn't I make the money? 
if I did the job, you know? Mm, exactly. And these were a set of tapes as well that uh, were worthless. They were sitting down in the basement. Um, they had been worthless since they were recorded, you know? Yeah. Uh, Warner Brothers owned the tapes initially. We were under contract to Warner's. I got releases from Warner's, you know? I sent them copies of the tapes. They didn't want to put it out. You know? They weren't Nobody interested. wanted to put it out. Yeah. The only reason I put it out myself was because I was sick to death of bootleg records. All we heard was bootleg albums for 11 years from Badfinger. No studio records and no, um, you know, official releases. All the Apple product was off the market. The Warner Brothers uh, product was off the market. Not because there wasn't a demand for it, mm. but because Apple had legal problems. And uh, Warner Brothers, uh, you know, for some, whatever reason they, they had, uh, they just didn't want to release it. And um, just the Warner Brothers stuff is still not available. And people would go out and buy it. I don't, I mean, I don't understand it. So, the, uh, that's really the situation with that record. Yeah. Uh, I'm telling you, I've got maybe 15 bootleg albums, including a couple of that particular record. Oh, really? And they sound like crap, you know. And, of course, you don't, get a, you, you don't get a cent out of them either. Pardon? You don't get any money out of them either. We don't get paid for them. No. I've actually been in stores years ago. I used to go in stores and take these albums out of the rack, you know, <laughs> and get really angry about it. I was in contact with Apple Records about the bootlegs. They laughed in my face. I was in contact with the record industry, you know, the RIAA. Mm -hmm. uh, in Washington D.C. about this about this stuff, and this is all a matter of record. This is Joe Mulland uh, working uh, on behalf of Badfinger, trying to find out who's bootlegging the records, how much money did they make, and where's the, where's the band's money? You know, yeah. Where's the where's the shares of it? Nobody else was doing anything, and eventually I got so bloody angry with it that I thought, well, wait a minute, I've got that live album downstairs. I'm going to process it, and I told all, all the people about it. I told Mike Gibbons and Bill Collins and everybody uh, about it. So you're very upfront uh, about it all. Pardon? You're very upfront about it all. It wasn't all, you know... Well, there wasn't any reason not to be. No, that's right. You know, it wasn't like we were going to go out and sell a million copies, and I was going to make, you know, millions and millions of dollars or something, and uh, I'm, I'm sitting in my basement in the dark, you know, plotting all this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a bloody, it's a reaction to being, to being screwed for years. And we got the record done, the record came out, and you know what, it sold a little bit. It didn't sell millions, it sold like 50,000, 40,000 units over a period of six or seven years, you know? Yeah. So it sold, what, 100 copies a week, 120 copies a week? Uh, but it sold, you know? And, I don't know, a lot of people were grateful for it. Yeah. You know? A lot of Badfinger fans really liked it. Uh, I, I, you know, I did mess around with the record, with the sound, uh, because I wanted to idealize our band. I wanted to put an ideal idea of, of what we sounded like live. And I think I know what the band wanted to sound like live, you know? And, uh, the, the, the problem is I, is I got paid for my efforts, and uh, people don't think that I should be paid for it. People think that, I, I, like I said, I just took that tape and threw it on the machine, and I made a record out of it. Yeah. Well, that's really the way it is. It's all going to come down. That dispute, and unfortunately, is going to come all down to, to lawyers and, uh, you know, the, 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 who, who owns the tapes, uh, all, all the regular legalities of it. And, and Joey Mond is going to be proved okay in the end. And uh, these people have lost one of their best friends. That's the way I'm looking at it. Mm. Um, you know, because there's no way that I'm going to be socialized with, with uh, Bill Collins anymore. You know, never in my life. And uh, it's a shame, but it's just the way it is. Yeah. You really ought to write a book, Joe. Well, I'm going to write a book. Yeah. You know what? I've held off doing that. I've had loads of people over the years tell me I should do that. I've had, you know, the guy who did Neil Young's biography came on to me. The guy who did Jerry Lewis's biography. Uh, these people have been in such want me to write the book. And I've always said no, because I'd have to kind of flower it up a little bit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because the inside story of the band is not all, you know, flowers and everything, you know? It's not pretty. There's some, there's some pretty sordid details in there. And uh, these are the kind of things that, you, you know, you go, well, this is not for people to hear about. But now, uh, these same people, uh, you know, they've branded me a thief and a liar, really. And, uh, okay, if that's how you want to play that game, then okay, then I'll tell my story and uh, we can see what goes on there. 
you know, we'll see how everybody feels about it. Yeah. You know, because I'm just, uh, I'm, you know, I'm really quite angry about this. This is my life here, my family, you know, my brothers, their children, and people all over the world. You know, kind of angry about it. But that's, you know, I don't know. That's that's what the dispute is about in answer to your question. <laughs> Talk about something more positive. Tell us about your current band. It's really good. Uh, I've got a trio, uh, Mark Healy playing bass and singing, and uh, Brian Jankus playing drums and singing, and myself. Uh, we do about 50, 60 shows a year. Uh, we do more if we can get them. Yeah. And uh, we've got a couple of roadies, and we have a little RV with a trailer, and uh, we load the gear, and away we go. And we've been, we've been uh, working in the studio now on new songs for the forthcoming album for Kaigan Records, which is out of Japan. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, an old friend of ours, Larry Lee, uh, is going to be producing. And uh, we're going to be getting into that in March. Uh, so we're, we're, we're kind of rehearsing now, writing songs like mad. And uh, we're looking forward to it. Fantastic. Any chance you'll bring them down here? We'd love to. Uh, you know what's really difficult? I don't know any people who go down there. I don't know promoters down there. Uh, we'd love to come and play down there. If anybody, you know, airs your show and is interested, they can call me, you know. Yeah, you've got my number. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, if anybody wants to get in touch, if you don't mind. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but we'd love to come down and play, and I think people would enjoy the band. It's a real rock band, you know. Uh, um, we, do, do the, we do the bad finger hits and stuff, and uh, we do a compilation of all the bad finger albums, uh, you know, several tracks from each album, and I do stuff from my solo records. What kind of venues mainly are you playing? Um, it varies. Um, in, in the winter and the fall months, we'll play a lot of rock clubs, uh, you know, three, four, five hundred seaters. And uh, then we'll do, in the summer, we'll do fairs. You know, that could be anything up to like 30,000 people. Yeah. You know, uh, they're all outdoors and the state fairs and the city festivals, you know. Uh, we do a lot of that stuff. We just played at the end for the NBA. Uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers game up in Cleveland. We played the Gundarina. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. People. Pardon? I heard about that. Yeah, it was terrific. Yeah, it was a lot of fun and uh, stuff like that. You know, so the, the gig sizes really vary depending on the time of the year and uh, what's going on, you know. There's a good balance of old and new fans coming to see you? It seems that way, yeah. It seems that way. You know, a lot of the young bands, uh, well, a few of the young bands, I should say, uh, talk about Badfinger as a major influence and... Uh, you know, so I've maybe some of their fans are kind of going, oh, I'll go and have a listen to this band, I'll go and have a look at them, you know. And it seems to be, you know, pretty, you know, pretty pretty varied audience, you know. Like, you don't get a lot of 40-odd-year-old people going to rock clubs anymore, you know. <laughs> True. So uh, uh, when the crowds are pretty full in those places, you know you're getting a pretty young audience. And yeah. Has it been uh, a problem at all for you over these, having your solo work, you know, accepted, but being, the problem of being compared always to your past work with Badfinger? Yeah, yeah, that is a bit of a problem, but it's a, uh, it's kind of a fact of life, you know. Because they're always going to compare what you do now with what you did yesterday and yeah. see if it measures up. Uh, I don't really think about that. The, the hard thing to do is to get people, DJs and the like, uh, to accept the Joey Mullen record. Uh, like Ryko, when I put my last album out, The Pilgrim, mm -hmm. Ryko, uh, after a month it was out, they had wrote and asked me, w would I mind if they changed the album to a Badfinger album? Because they felt it would be accepted easier into the, sh into the stores and into the radio stations, you know? It just changed and, the name uh, of it. I said no, of course, yeah. you know, because, uh, you know, I thought that would be a bit much, you know. But, uh, but that's what happens, you know, people... It's easier to market Badfinger than it is to market uh, Joey Mullen, but yeah. I don't think the records have been uh, total failures in terms of acceptance by the fans and stuff. And uh, I know, because I get calls, I've got an agreement on my kitchen table now from a label that wants to re-release my first solo album, After the Pearl. Oh, great. They say they get hundreds of calls about it, and letters, and uh, we got a, we got a, uh, an email the other night from Howard Stern. You know who Howard Stern is? Yeah. Okay, we got an email from Howard Stern the other day. Really nice uh, thing. Said he'd met us in, uh, years ago. We gave him our autographs and stuff. But one of the questions he asked was why isn't uh, After the Pearl, which is my first solo album, he, he asked why is that not on CD? And stuff like that. <laughs> so it's kind of been, you know, both sides of that, that coin. Uh, yes. It is a it is a problem to get that the stuff's out there and it's not you know it doesn't 
sell like crazy. But at the same time, it's quite rewarding to get these reactions from the fans and from people like that saying that they really dig the record and think the songs uh, stand up with anything they've heard, you know. <laughs> Involved in some historic sessions over the years too. Um, first one that springs to mind is the Imagine album. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember much about those sessions? Um, oh yeah, I remember a lot about it. It was very, uh, you know, it was a very exciting day for me. You know, starting with uh, this fella called they, they called us up. Uh, I think maybe George called and uh, asked us, did we want to do a session for John that night? He wanted some guitars, and uh, would we do it? And um, we said, yeah, of course. And he said, well, who's there? And it was only Tommy Evans and myself at the house at the time. So he said, well, we'll send the car over for you guys and just bring your guitars and come on down. Mm -hmm. So they sent over Joe, who was John's driver, and a nice a bit, of a, a bit of a limo, Daimler, and uh, picked us up and drove Tommy and I down to uh, Surrey, you know, to his house in Surrey. It's a big white house. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was really magic. Um, you know, where we were at John's house, and he wasn't even up, it was late, it was about 10.30 at night, 10 o'clock or something, John was in bed, and uh, we got all set up in the studio, we had a studio in the back of the house there, and uh, all the other players were there, Nicky Hopkins, and Jim Keltner playing the drums, and uh, Klaus Vorman playing the bass, and uh, Tommy and I, mm. and all uh, playing uh, guitars, you know, um, and he, he, George was there, and Phil Spector, uh, although we didn't really see Phil Spector, we saw George, he was our kind of main contact with those guys, you know. And uh, then John came in with Yoko, and he was very nice and, and, and very straightforward, and uh, we played the tunes, we played Jealous Guy, and uh, we played I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. Um, he was, like I say, we were very straightforward, and uh, he showed us the chords and sang the song to us. We actually suggested a chord to put in the song, it's like a minor ninth uh, in the sequence. So we, um, he liked that, and, and uh, he actually said at the end of the session, I like these bad finger guys, they're, they're good, aren't they? They're fucking good, or whatever he said, you know. <laughs> and uh, he's a very plain spoken man, you know. Yeah. And uh, it was a great thrill for me, you know. John was, uh, I think, out of them all, me, me, me fave, you know. Mm. And um, although. He, you know, they were the Beatles, so <laughs> it's very difficult to say that. Um, so it, it was very exciting, very magical night for me. I'll never forget as long as I live. Uh, seeing his house, uh, seeing the, you know, the oddball things in there. Things like black carpet, you know, it, it was stuff like that, which I'd never seen. And um, the, 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 the room full of Dr. Pepper, you know. <laughs> <laughs> The the uh, the old Rockola jukebox in the kitchen with all the big rock hits on it, you know. Yeah. I mean, it was very much like just like you'd imagine John's place to be. Very cool, very beautiful. Um, a thing that was really surprising was how nice Yoko was. You know, after hearing all this stuff about her, uh, she was really, really nice and really just really friendly and really lovely to to everybody. Really polite and really helpful. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, she just kind of kept him out shut while Johnny was working, and you know didn't get in the way or nothing like that. I didn't make you know make any suggestions other than uh, they both were uh, egging Nicky Hopkins on to work an intro out for the song. You know, come on, Nicky, you can do it. You know, <laughs> and because uh, Nicky came through as he always well, as he always did and with flying colours, you know, mm. such a great player. I'd known Nicky for even at that time I'd known him for ten, twelve years. He was one of the first major musicians I met when I was a boy. Uh, yeah, it was just a great time. It was a great night. Obviously, yeah, it's obviously a memory that that stuck with you for sure. There's a Bad Finger tribute album out and about. Yeah, there is, yeah. A fellow Daddle, um, Daddle something or other out of... Uh, Daddle Klingman, my wife is saying. Uh, out of uh, Houston, Texas has put it together. Yeah, and there's a lot of great people on it. The Knacker on it, uh, Al Cooper... Amy Mann, you know who Amy Mann is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's singing, there's a great version of Baby Blue. Uh, the Plimsolls are on it, they do a version of Suitcase. Um, who else is on there? Just a bunch of people, you know, it's great. Adrian Ballou is on there. Um, Bill Lloyd is on there. Uh, Dwight Twilley. Oh, yeah. Is on there, yeah. Bunch of people. It's really nice. You know, there's a couple of a couple of lesser known acts on there too, but it's really nice. And uh, 
you know, we're greatly honoured by that. Well, I am. Anyway, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's pretty marvellous. You know, mm. these people actually take the time to do it. You know, it's really knockout. You know, I believe there's also an album of um, Pete Ham demos that are uh, that's in the wind as well. Yeah. Well, that's out. That, that's uh, it's either out or it's coming out. I'm not sure. Uh, I got an advanced copy of it. Yeah, and uh, it's really pretty nice. Um, you know, it's well put together. The sound is good. Uh, the songs are, you know, are, 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 some of them are very good, some of them are, are, are a bit twee, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's, it's an old, old demo from when he first started writing and stuff. Yeah, the sound quality is really good. His voice is sounding excellent. And, uh, you know, wish him all the best with it. Good luck with it, you know. Yeah. I think it'll be good for preservation, no <coughs> matter what on there, which will really show, uh, it really shows what happens to a song from the demo to what happens when the band does it. Yeah. I mean, the people are going to be really surprised with the way Pete did this song in the beginning, you know. And how it progressed, it's, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable. Now, you've also done a bit of production work for other bands? Yes, that's something I'm really, really interested in doing. Uh, you know, I'll even come all the way to Australia if anybody wants me to. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm very, very interested in doing it. Uh, I've just got a new record coming out... Um, on a group called Anna Cranna, uh, which is a group from New England that's coming out on Big Deal Records. And uh, I've just produced that, and I, I just was talking to the lead singer, and uh, he's really happy with it, the band's really happy, the label's really happy, and we're really kind of excited about it. You know, it's something that, uh, just something I think is, it, it's really good, and I think I finally got my head together in terms of doing that for groups, you know. Mm -hmm. Producing and bringing out the, bringing out the, the, the little diamond there, you know. And that's the idea, I think. Hmm. Well, to finish up, um, what would you say 30 years in rock and roll has taught you more than anything else, Joe? Uh, just to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> get ready. Uh, and it's not a bad world, you know. Hmm. It's not a bad place that we live in, uh, and people generally are pretty nice. That's what it showed me. Yeah. All right. And roll is the truth as well, you know. And remaining plans for 97? Uh, well, when we hear some new songs, like I said before, and we're, we're going to make a new record. We're going to go to Japan on tour, and we're going to come back to America. The record's going to come out here. We're going to come. We're going to go on tour in America and promote it. Um, we're going to settle these disputes with Badfinger. <laughs> And uh, we're going to kick the boys. We've got a couple of boys. We're going to kick them in the butt so they can get into colleges and stuff. And uh, we're going to we're going to enjoy our swimming pool during the summer. Mm -hmm. We had a swimming pool installed last year, <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to opening it again. It's snow. We've got like four feet of snow right here. Oh really? Oh yeah, right outside the house here. We've got a jag outside buried. Oh, I'm totally envious. We're having a hottest summer in years here at the moment. Oh, yeah, yeah. You'd probably like a bit of this. Maybe we could send you a couple of buckets of stuff. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> All right, Joe, listen, I thank you for your time. I hope it's a you great year for you. And uh, you. we'll be in touch, and hopefully we'll see you down here sometime. Okay. Hey, I tell you what, uh, do me a favor, send me a tape of this. Yeah, we'll do. If you would, do you have yeah. an address? Yeah, I've got the address. I'll do that for sure. Please. Thank you very much, and I uh, wish everybody down there Merry Christmas. No worries. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. See you later. See ya. Bye-bye.